this. I should, but I don't. Okay. <laughs> We're live, by the way. So today we have Final Cut Pro Radio TV live. We have Mr. Gary Adcock. I finally got the hands worked out where I can point to the right person. For for me, it's it's different than you on Skype. But, well, I don't yeah. I don't see side to side. I just see exactly up so, exactly. So to me, you're down there. <laughs> oh yeah, okay, that's right. Because on the Skype, you're up above. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So we have a lot of we have a there's a lot to talk about all of a sudden. I you know summertime typically, especially with Apple and Final Cut Pro and stuff, it's like the dog days of summer. Nothing oh, happens yeah. in the summertime. Nothing. No Final Cut Pro updates. It's like not till September you can you expect things. And now we have the summer of the Mac Pro. Yeah. I you mean, know, it, 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 it's, it usually stopped with WWDC. Because exactly. People are, I mean, we were waiting for phones or iPads or anything else. And there wasn't any news that came out for Mac professionals. Exactly. And, and, and it's, been, it's been tough on us the last few years. But, you know, with um, the uh, – I love the, the joke that somebody put it on. And I think it was Burger came – Burger King called it, or Mac, it was Mac Rumors, called it the cheese grater extreme. <laughs> and, and, and you know, it's funny how, you know, everybody's mocked Apple for working with it, you know, going back to the cheese grater, for lack of a better phrase of it. But the design is actually pretty impressive. And, I, and yeah, I, if, it, very... if it works, if it works, I mean, they fixed all the things that were wrong with the first cheese grater, like the handle. <laughs> right. It, it goes I, in. You're Go not ahead. the first person to talk about that, how sharp that handle was. I never really had a real big issue with it, but. Yeah, I carried one the first year at, at um, the very first year they were out. I carried one with some friends of mine from Apple into Comic-Con. Okay. And it was the only time I ever went to Comic-Con. And, and it was one of those things that we carried it from the Marriott next door. And by the time we got into the convention center in San Diego, literally your hands were bleeding wow. from the edges. Wow. Now, why, and, you know, well, and, I wonder why that they, happened. Yeah. Eh, they never thought they would ever be carried or moved very far or, or it was cheaper to not camper the edges on the inside of that handle. I mean, it's a, it, it's a manufacturing process. It cost an extra you know, 35 or 40 cents per unit to, to camper all those handles inside when they didn't think people would ever use them that way. And look how many people cut them off to, you know, to rack mount them. <laughs> now, well, they just have a handle that, now they just have a handle that collapses in the inside and you don't see it. It's great. That's true. I, I never, you know, I guess I just set mine down in the studio and I very, I just rarely picked it up. So I didn't, I never really carried it anywhere. Yeah. Most people didn't. I mean, and I mean, and they made for difficult for shipping purposes too, because you'd always break the handles. If you ever shipped the unit and had a case for it, it would get banged around, and those oh. handles would always dent and collapse. And then you could never sell it again because the aluminum was deformed. So oh, that's the handles interesting. Got, yeah, yeah, the handles got beat up a lot when you were a guy like me carrying one around for demo purposes. I never thought about that. See, that's nothing else. I never, I didn't do. I didn't yeah. really ship them anywhere. I just bought. A, I have a. I have a G5 downstairs right. and an Intel, both of them from my recording studio downstairs. So I never had that issue. So the handles. But where was Jonathan Ives in those days? I, you know, they 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 didn't think about those kinds of things. It wasn't part of the focus. I mean, you know, we didn't think we needed to rack mount computers a decade ago. Mm, that's a good point. The, the old you know, cheese grater. Did, yeah. And, and and the focus has always been to go smaller, lighter, faster. Hence Thunderbolt and why we, you know, why we embrace Thunderbolt and why the laptops are so much smaller than they are in the PC world is because of how Apple's been been forced on this. But but with the Mac Pro, we needed a professional product. And 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 God, look at the people complaining that it's too professional for them. <laughs> We've gone from, oh, God, we have to have a professional product to, oh, too much, too much, too much. What do we do? And and it's kind of funny to me how many people have, have like, oh, oh well, it's too, you know, it's more than I wanted. It's a truck. It's designed to be that. And that I'm glad it is. I'm glad it, they, I'm glad they didn't compromise and make something like a I kept I kept teasing. They're going to have a mini cheese grater. I kept saying that a mini, you know, smaller desktop cheese grater. Well, well, they I didn't mean, do that. Look, they yeah. didn't do that. And you look at the power of what's in, you know, the 5K iMac or in the Mac Mini, and and those are good enough for the vast majority of users. 
but but the Mac Pro is built for a whole different level of that. I mean, seven seven PCI slots. They say eight, but if they're going to put shit in one of them, you know, it means there's only seven. <laughs> well, one's a half. It, it's you, a, yeah, it's it's a half hard half half size cart that comes with the only USB slots on the on the computer. Right. So it's right. like okay, so there's technically only seven PCIe slots, only which only three of them are 16 lane, which is the way I read that. Uh, I mean, there's 16 lanes in the two MPX compatible right. slots but right but for the most part there's basically three 16 lane and you know four three lane or eight lane four 16 lane and four eight lane select pcie slots in the way it works out but so, the interesting thing to me is the is the thunderbolt stuff the thunderbolt stuff is buried in here because <laughs> while it keeps telling you there are internal thunderbolt ports it won't tell you where they're at or show you what it is. But in Apple's own diagrams, you cl very clearly see internal display port connections, which is for jumping from the internal card part of the cards to get out. Oh, so that's okay. kind of an interesting thing for me. And it's like, you look at how the design is. It's it's eight PCIe slots. One's a half byte that comes with a card in it. So there's technically seven. You know, you've got four that are 16 lane and three that are eight lane. Well, eight lane is as good as we get out of Thunderbolt now. And most right. of the video I.O. handle doesn't need more than eight lanes. I mean, the Kona cards, uh, Blackmagic, you know, all the stuff that works on Thunderbolt all works on an eight lane bus. So they don't need any more than that for I.O., even an 8K. So the eight lane cards are actually suitable for a lot of the I.O. process, particularly when you're talking about, you know, up to and including Thunderbolt 3. It's those four 16 lane slots that I'm really interested in because the power of those uh, of the Vega cards, and particularly the way Apple's touting it, that's kind of, gives kind of an interesting thing. But well, no it's Nvidia, interesting, yeah. No Nvidia. <laughs> well, I don't get I don't get no Nvidia. <laughs> well, from what I understand, it's just a matter of Apple and Nvidia uh, agreeing on who's going to be in control of the drivers. You know. NVIDIA wants to control their drivers, and Apple says, you're going to do the same as everybody else. We're in control of those drivers. I mean, we have to approve them or whatever. And from what I understand, that's the holdup. It's not physically. The card can go in there physically. Oh, yeah. Right? So yeah. it's a matter of, you know. I mean, here's the thing. It, don't bet against Apple, NVIDIA. That, I, 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 I'm, I'm not. Well, and you look at the, some of the technology in there. I mean, you know, the ability to... The way they've designed this machine to be extensible is amazing. But screwdrivers still in this day and age? Really? No window no Windows machine I know of needs a screwdriver to change cards. Now how did you oh you oh to change the cards? Oh to I change see. the cards or open the things up. I okay. mean all of those boards have Phillips screw heads on them. I didn't say what how did you notice that? I didn't notice that. I just because I looked for it. It didn't because they're not recessed, they're not raised out to be early. Okay little knobs okay I, I mean in the old days they were they were phillips screwdrivers but they had little knurling knobs on them right, these are recessed right. into the boards now they look like it requires a phillips screwdriver to take in a you know to 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 do anything that's kind of backwards compatible in my world because that's a whole bunch of little parts you now have to deal with and source and everything else so but, we got but, we got a comment on the youtube chat from isaac Taranas. he says it's not so much no nvidia it's no cuda I don't well, know that's that... true. Yeah. Okay. That's, well, because Apple wants control of the ecosystem, and and by sticking with Metal or OpenCL, they can they can stay in their own environment because that works best for their operating system. But that's not necessarily what's needed for the graphics and everything else. And AMD, while doing some nice stuff, is not anywhere close to doing ray tracing and you know and some of the stuff that Nvidia does. They just they're just farther ahead. Right. And I, I think everybody has jumped on metal, right? Uh, pretty much. I mean, uh, NVIDIA boards will run metal in older versions of the OS. Oh, they will. Okay. Yeah, you, it's just a hack. I mean, you have to make it work. You've got to fight the driver issues. Right. You can work around it. I mean, I have friends that are running current betas. Uh, 12.4, 12, 12 I think is the current one. Um, that are that are running NVIDIA boards, but it's a pain in the butt. And it's just not worth it to have to fight the driver updates and everything when the, when the right, AMD right, cards right. just work. But right. the NVIDIA stuff for certain technologies is far superior. 
oil and gas and how they do ray tracing and and that kind of stuff. Their their ability to do higher end graphics processing is just far superior to what AMD has at this point in time. Right. You know, and, and when we're talking about augmented reality and what Apple's, what a Adobe's doing with Aero, what Apple's doing with AR Kit, I think those are really important areas to be talking about, and not to be limited to one graphics card or the other. Right. Well, that's a good point. I, I didn't think about all that because I just, you know, my main concern is video editing. That's what. Well, I'm... and 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 we all are. I mean, and but I come from a a print graphics background, so I'm always thinking about color sync and how those technologies work. But it's also because I live on the front end of everything, Richard, that I'm always looking for what's new. I'm always trying to find out what's next in all of this. And, and, it's, and I think it's really important for people to think about that. And, you know, we start talking about augmented reality and what AR is going to do and how Apple, because of their dominance in phone and tablets, has the ability to do something nobody else can. I mean, that's kind of interesting when you think about it. It absolutely I mean, is. Yeah. I mean, the fact when you think that you're carrying around on my iPhone 10, you know, carries as much computing power as man had on the entire planet 50 oh, yeah. years ago when we put people on the moon. That was that was the, each phone has the computing power of the entire planet at that, that time. And and, you know, here we are a month out, less than a month out from the 50th anniversary of the moon landing. And we're carrying that much power around in our pockets. It just shows the level of technology that's around us and how companies like Apple have keep driving it in a way that not everybody pays attention to. Right. No, and, that, that's I, exactly true. Well, and you look at augmented reality and how phone, and the phones and the tablets that we carry with us all the time can integrate that. Look at what we've done with the watch, the Apple watch, and how you know they're doing heartbeat thing and glucose monitoring and everything else and you know afib tests and that and it's like you know you have to think that there's a new generation of this and this processing has to go more well i'm you know i was debating i have a 2017 imac which is it's a quad core and it's been yeah. good it's been good for me 32 gigs of ram uh, one terabyte ssd and i've been waiting to update I wanted to update something in 2019, 2020, and I, you know, the Mac, the iMac Pro was really, really tempting, but I, you know, I said, I want to wait to see what this Mac Pro is, and I'm really glad I'm waiting, that I waited, because I'm going to get not a high-end Mac Pro, I'm not going to stuff it with cards and everything, but I'm going to get a, probably a 12 or 16 core Mac Pro. With... Well, and I think it's a pretty good idea. I, I mean, when you look at the specs that are in at it, um, I'm going to tell everybody to, to avoid the 8 core. Right, because of the the, the memory difference is so is so radical. I That's mean, a now good you have point. to do if, if if you're going with the eight core, you use slower memory than you do in all the rest of the models. Now, it's my understanding that the chip is not soldered down; that it it appears to be removable or changeable, which would be a really radical thing for Apple. Even if it's not having going just up a notch and getting the faster memory would is vastly superior and it must cost less. Uh, you know, and, and I'm like you, I'm, I, I would go for a middle of the road machine, you know, right. you start looking at the maxed out version of the damn thing being 45 or $50,000. Yeah, yeah. That's going to be I, insane. I mean, it, well, but it would also like, like kick ass just about anything. No, no. I, I realize that people are, you know, the Hollywood studios are going to be having these were by the rack full. I'd imagine. What, what was the, what was, what was the movie they just cut uh, in pro tools? They did the pro tools for, was it? Uh, Rocket Man or Bohemian Ra Rocket Ram, I think it was. They cut okay. on on a high end on one of the new Mac Pros with eight Pro Tools cards, Avid cards in it. Oh, I Which saw I was, that. I thought that was pretty stunning that they, you know, they actually gave one to somebody to do something like that. Well, they That's they said, a... yeah, they said it's the most uh, HD uh, Pro Tools cards in any computer ever. That doesn't surprise me at all. Yeah, I mean, there's not a lot of PCs that have that many slots. Well, even, even with ex, even with expansion chassis, it's hard to get. Right. Those when we were when we talked last time, when you were on uh, the show, I asked you what you'd expect in the Mac Pro. I think you said four PCI slots, and I think most people would be would have been expecting. I was expecting. I would be surprised if it had four, and now they have eight. seven and a half or eight, whatever you want to call it. It's just it was astounding. Yeah. It was just a completely when you know what when, it was so astounding when they first showed the Mac Pro and looked like the cheese grater on stage. I thought it was fake. I thought they were going to say no, no, no. We're just kidding. That's this is, oh, this is one more thing. <laughs> one more thing. This is the old. This we're just teasing you. 
And they didn't do that. They kept going and going. I said, this is incredible. Absolutely incredible. Well, I mean, and, and, and the fact that they, they, all the little things on it, you know, that the release is on the top of the computer, that the hands yes. go away, that it comes yes. with, you know, that, that you could put wheels on it is kind of stupid in my world. You know, <laughs> I can see somebody putting wheels on it and riding it around an office until it breaks. Right. You know, it's, it, it becomes that, that I don't necessarily understand. But, but the fact that all of that's removable and you can rack mount it, it's a rack mountable version. Yes. They, they yes. actually, they actually thought about this in a manner that, that behooves Apple to have actually talked to enough professionals to get those kinds of responses. On. Well, here's what they did. Apple brought all these professionals in a group all together. And he's, they said, what do you want to see in a Mac Pro? And they said, we want A and we want B and we want C and we want D and E and F. And Apple said, okay, yeah. we'll give it all to you, give you everything. Well, I mean, and, and, you, and, and look at the power supply. It's, the <laughs> it's power a small, supply. small furnace. <laughs> I mean, you know, you you got 1.4 kilowatt of, ba of juice in there. Hell, that's enough to run a Tesla. <laughs> yeah, well, they said somebody said uh, it comes with a Tesla battery or something, oh, solar oh, yeah, panel on the roof. Yeah. Well, it certainly it's going to require that for backup purposes. But but I mean, you look at that, and you look at the MPX expansion modules and what they're trying to do. You know, being able to, to group cards in there, and then how those expansion modules have multiple Thunderbolts out on it. I mean, my rough guess is two in the back, two on the top. Um, you'll probably have eight on video cards in your machine if you got a couple of graphics cards, which each have four or Thunderbolt ports on them. Right. You know, you're looking at eight Thunderbolt ports. Right. Which is four complete buses. We're gonna we're gonna say for for right. just working purposes those are four complete buses right that's that's a lot of bandwidth when you start talking about you know just shy of three gigabits per bus right you know, that's a lot of bandwidth that's that's a lot of bandwidth to have talking about something apple doesn't normally do two of the thunderbolt ports are easily accessible from the front you don't have to go behind the computer to get to them right the two on the top which is great yeah yeah but there's two in the back also yes Yes, there's two and, in the back. Which, but, but then it's the ones on the cards that, that become interesting because all of the Radeon cards, all of the higher-end Radeon cards, all come with four slots, four Thunderbolt 3 slots. That's got to be two buses per, just the you way those think. cards are. Yeah, you would absolutely yeah, that, that would be Yeah, that would be logical on with video cards of that resolution and that capacity. You'd expect those to be two separate Thunderbolt buses. So now you start talking about, you know, one in the back, one in the front, one in the top, one in the side. And you've got enough power to do just about anything. But but remember, too, that the data is separate than the video bandwidth in Thunderbolt. So you don't lose anything by also putting a monitor on those same machines because the, the, the display port that's used for all of this technology is a dedicated part of the port. And it, it doesn't inflict on or doesn't conflict with any of the, the data needs. Oh, OK. I didn't see. I didn't and, know that. Oh yeah, the, the the DisplayPort technology is is a fixed bandwidth part of the Thunderbolt spec, so it's limited at all times. You can't get to it any other way except okay. the DisplayPort. It's the only part of the spec that's actually limited that way. <laughs> so now you have this ability to put all this kind of connectivity on there. So it's not just the DisplayPort monitors we're talking about. It's Thunderbolt accessories, it's servers and everything else. But now we have this connectivity because of USB-C to support virtually anything on the on the computer. And with the way the MPX slots and the way the PCI slots are done, you have the ability to do a lot. Think about bonding two of the MPX outbound boards to an external chassis with more cards in it. Right. Think about that. I, I mean, think about that, especially when you consider that each one of those MPX boards has a 470-watt power supply secondary to the, <laughs> you know, the, the PCI graphics card. And it's like all of a sudden you start talking about 475 watts of power. That's a lot of juice. Yeah, absolutely it is. I have a oh. uh, dedicated 20 amp circuit downstairs waiting for it. <laughs> I, I'm in a I'm in a um, uh, a 200 amp three phase building. So yeah, I got lots of juice. Oh, okay, so, there you go. Uh, I could I, I'm I'm in an old industrial building that that was built in 1880s, and it's it's funny because yeah, I have three phase 200 amp service into my building. Wow, that's and I'm the great. only guy, and I'm the yeah. only guy who knows how to work it. So I can go up and play with the electrical stuff. Oh, there you everybody's go. Afraid of it. Everybody's afraid of it. Yeah. Oh man, it's it's it's. You know, we're talking 
pre 1900s, early 1900s electrical system. Okay. And, you know, my, my, my elevator dates from 1910. Do you have a door, an elevator operator? No, but it is manual. Got to pull the gate up and down. Got to get down. Got to get that. And the, and at the top of the elevator, um, because it's so old, it's operated in DC. Is so that all right? The switch, all the switching is mecha mechanical DC switches. And wow. They're huge. They're, they're, they're like the size of this water bottle kind of contacts. Yeah, yeah. We had some of those down at the archives, National Archives in D.C. They had some old, old elevators. They were always breaking down, <laughs> always chronically breaking I, down. So I, you know, The reason this one breaks down is because people forget to close the inner doors. <laughs> but, well, but, so so we, the one thing we haven't talked about here is the monitor. Well, we have, yeah, let, let's stick on, just for a minute, stick on the Mac Pro. What about the afterburner card. Now I've seen the cost of a, they've compared it to a red rocket and the red rocket's like $7,000. Well, yeah, I mean, Kona cards have FPGAs in them. Having a programmable chipset in a PCI card is not anything new. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm guessing they're probably gonna be in the $2,500 to $3,500 range. I don't think they're going to be as expensive as seven thousand dollars. Okay. But the interesting thing about having an FPGA in there is that you know you'll be able to program it. You could run software for Sony specific camera codecs or Red specific camera codecs, or you know you're going to be doing OpenEXR and Aces, and it does that. You could be working in in we'll think about Phantom or animation files or or. Audio, I mean, not that audio is as big an issue as the seek time is for audio. So, I mean, you start thinking about the other options with that. And, and having an FPGA in there offers some really advanced technology. Say you want it to be able to render 3D and you put in a hyper engine just for uh, a 3D printer on the FPGAs. Okay. You know, uh, being able to program that chipset and being able to have it as a software programmable chipset. Um, that that can be controlled is a very very interesting process, and and I mean people don't realize how many things they have have FPGAs in them. All their cameras have FPGAs in them. You really? know, when you do a firmware update, yeah, a firmware update in a camera, you're just updating the processor. And and I mean it's the cameras and and you know Blackmagic cards and AJ cards and Matrix cards and and Avid cards are all FPGA based. Okay, so it's I a didn't very interesting way to do that. And the interesting thing is, is the Red Rocket was not FPGA based. It was a risk based. So it was a different kind of processor. So you, once it was set, you couldn't change it. But okay. with FPGA, you can constantly update them and have them do different things. That's very interesting. So if it's going to be twenty, say just say three thousand, that's going to be that's going to that's not bad compared to the Red Rocket. If you need that, if you need well, that. Well, yeah, and and again, you know, we're talking about a machine that's made for professionals. Yes, um, absolutely. If, you know, seven thousand bucks to a pro. That's a that's if it saves him a week, he's paid for the card. Oh yeah, absolutely. If it saves him a week of work. He's paid for the card, and, well, and that's how that's how you have to look at those kind of things. Well, the other issue is I typically replace my Max on a th three like two and a half year cycle. Yeah, me too. So I'm replacing. I just replaced my. I have a 2016 MacBook Pro. I just bought a 2019 eight core. And I'll be selling my 2016, and um, then when the the 2017 iMac I have, I have about a year and a half left on Apple Care. I'll sell it before the, the Apple Care is out next year, and this is what I'll be basing my um, some of my money for the Mac, buying a Mac Pro. Now I went on Apple's site, and this 2017 iMac is selling for $2,800 refurbed. Yeah. So it's still got you know some good good cash left like in it. Well, see, and that's the thing is, is that, you know, this stuff lasts forever. I mean, I, I don't traditionally sell my computers. I will give them to family and stuff like that. Sure. My wife gets great. My wife gets great hand-me-downs. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, she's like, uh, when are you getting a new laptop? Um, right, right, getting right, right, exactly. <laughs> but, 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 you know, I, I tend to, I tend to shower my family with those kinds of things because I don't, I don't give my, I don't sell my computers back because it's just one of those things. A lot of times I'll get software that it's like locked to the, the operating systems and everything okay. else. And, and there's, there's restrictions or there used to be restrictions with certain business entities where you couldn't sell the hardware once you put their software on it. Oh, that's, um, well, oh, that's interesting. Yeah. And, and, you know, so you couldn't, so it's like, you'd have to have them, you have to, you know, I had, I did one government kind of contract 
where I physically had to take the hard drives out of my computers and turn my computers back in when I was done. They wow. wanted the hard drive out of the machine because they didn't want any of the data. So I actually physically had to take the hard drive out of my computer when I was done with the project. Hmm. What a pain in the ass. Yeah, that is a pain in the ass. No, well, but you, 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 I, get a, I get weird things. So speaking <laughs> of hard drives, so they have that, the, 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 uh, who was it, Promise made the module that fits in there with Promise spinning drives. With spinning yeah. drives. Yeah, I don't. That's 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 just uh, uh, foolish. It's all well, it's it's an odd thing to be doing in, in 2019, I think. But it's it's cheaper well, than SSDs. Promise, especially yeah. with Promise, who's had a great reputation in the, in the early part of the Thunderbolt world, but right. in the last few years has been non-existent on the marketplace. Uh, I mean, they even blew off my PR meeting with them at NAB. I mean, I had a meeting with the president of the company, and he just didn't bother showing up for it. Wow. And, and and it was one of those things that was like, I was real interested in their new series. You know, they, they, they put um, their, their new Thunderbolt 3 stuff. They put a display port out of the storage okay. to utilize the display port bandwidth. It actually supported up to 8K. So it was like, I was really interested in looking at these. And, and, and but there's been so many changes at Promise. And, and uh, you know, they just they, they just screwed up. And, but like didn't follow through with me to try and make it right. But it was just interesting. It's like a company that can't even like follow through in their PR meetings and hasn't done very much. I'm not, not really sure about what that's going to be. I yeah. know they're the only storage currently listed for that, but I'm yeah. sure other people will come up with MPX modules. Well, I, I, no, I think yeah. that's going to be a very interesting thing. Yeah, I think so too. And I think you're absolutely correct. There'll be other people like OWC will come in with some kind of an internal RAID system that fits in there. And the other thing is there's no reason why that, I.O. card that Apple ships stock can't be replaced for something better, well, perhaps. Well, yeah, I mean, I mean, the I.O. card that's in there is a, is a half slot with two USB ports on it, right. four USB ports. They can put anything on a half slot card. Right. I mean, you could have more Thunderbolts, you could have HDMI, you could have all kinds of things on a PCI slot. And uh, does it... I, 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 I would expect different manufacturers. I, I, I don't I don't use that company, uh, but I look at I look at, you know, what GTEC might offer what some of the other manufacturers might offer sure. and look at that form factor. When you think that based on the size metrics that I saw, you could probably put um, maybe 12 SSDs in that same space. Wow. I mean, look at, think, think <laughs> of 12, two terabyte SSDs. And I just saw, I just reached out to the SanDisk over this. They are now showing SSDs that have a capacitor on. Them. So that each SSD has its own, limited power supply hmm. for to complete read write cycles i'm working on a process with them i just reached out to them this morning on it but it's like now you can actually buy drives that have backup power on them. individual drives that have hmm. backup power in ssd and they can read and write and, and, and they're designed for data centers so they're designed for power outages in data centers which never happen but they're but that, it's that extra level of redundancy sure. think about having something like that in your machine where sure. you've got you know, a three, four gigabyte a second, six gigabyte a second SSD, and you've got, you know, 20 terabytes of them in a solid state array that's being fan cooled. And, and you start at, talking about, you know, having an unlimited amount of power to a ridiculous level of bandwidth that makes, you know, 8K graphics and real time playback and all that stuff, you know, much simpler, much faster, and certainly the quality that it needs to be for professional finishing. Now, have, do you know if the SSDs are replaceable, the stock SSD? I would assume they are. But but the now the OS in, encrypts that? Uh, well, it the, always did. I, oh, I mean, drives okay. were always encrypted to a certain level because of, you know, once you wrote the data to it because of their IDs, you know, they have individual MAC addresses on them okay. um, that for, for connectivity purposes and those individual codes were written by the OS. Now, I think that's just a safety factor. But I mean, the drives are getting smaller and smaller. The M2 right. drives that are in, you know, I mean, you know, I have a terabyte uh, uh, SSD in my laptop that's about the size of my thumb. I mean, you know, they're, they're really small now. And if you look at the position in Apple's diagram, they're actually way down in the bottom front of the machine as far away from the RAM as possible, which I thought was kind of interesting. They hmm. actually bury the very the drives or where they indicate the SSDs are are underneath the two MPX slots. Huh. I wonder why. Very, I guess just the design. A, a closeness to the graphics. I don't know. You know, there's there's reasons why they put storage where they put it sometimes. Right. But there's right. lots of things on this that are pretty interesting. I mean, you know, and yeah, it's expensive. 
if if it's too expensive, it's not made for you. Well, that's exactly that's exactly correct. Yeah, if it's too expensive, expensive, it's not for you. Now, it's too expensive for me, but I'm getting one anyway. <laughs> it's just good. It, but see, you're looking at the long-term business aspect. Exactly. And you're using it for what you're using it for, and and that's different. I mean, I expect to drop fifteen or twenty thousand on one. Right. I mean, that's I'm I'm expecting to get one that'll be pretty high end, middle of the road. Right. You know? <laughs> but that's not a fifty thousand dollar computer. Right. Well, the other thing is for for logic, I'll be using it for to run more plugins than usual. Right. That's that's one of the other things. You, not only the video, but the the logic. I can run a lot more plugins. Hopefully. Well, that's also one of the advantages of going with a larger number of processors. You get more RAM. Right. You, know, you get a twelve or sixteen core. You've got you've got five or six hundred, seven hundred megs of RAM in the thing. That changes everything. Anybody oh, who's ever point. worked with more anybody who's ever worked with more than a hundred megs of RAM will realize very quickly how much that changes everything. And a hundred megs, hundred gigs right. of RAM. I remember in OS nine when you put a gig of RAM in a machine, it used to give you a warning to come up and say, <laughs> you know, you have too much, much RAM. Too Are much. you crazy? Yeah, nobody has this much RAM. It would literally yeah. say that in the early builds of OS nine. That's you funny. had a gigabyte of RAM in a computer. And now we don't think about that. I mean, I have 32 gigs in my laptop. That's, right. And that used to be the holy grail. Hitting 32 gigs will allow you to do After Effects and everything else. And, you know, and, and now we can carry that around in a laptop that, that, that has, you know, a gigabyte a second data transfers on the logic board. So, That's incredible. So they say 1.5 terabytes of RAM. But I heard somebody say if you get the 28 core, you can actually, it'll actually support two terabytes. Um, yeah, there's some question about that because there's not enough of those 28 core cards to be out for it, chips right. to be out there. And when you look at the individual price of the chip being something roughly around $22,000, you're not wow. going to be a whole lot of people. Yeah, the 28 core chip is, the wholesale cost on the 28 core chip is around twenty two or $23,000. Wow, that's incredible. Oh, yeah. That's but, incredible. But but those are used for servers and things like that. Those are used for machines that need that kind of CPU balancing and all that kind of stuff. And and there's applications for it. If you're working in science or art, if you're working in real time graphics, I mean, think of how that changes real time graphics and, and oil and gas technologies and those kind of things where you're doing mathematical computations that have to be put into RAM. Right. There's, I look at it for modeling and other things. I mean, there's all these aspects that people have forgotten that we use computers for that we're doing, you know, <clears throat> we're doing, you know, all kinds of crazy things related to processing of data and AR and VR and that, you know, you start thinking about augmented reality, and virtual reality, and what those require. Think about, you know, producing 60 frame a second gaming in 4K or 72 frame a second gaming in 4K or 8K. And all of a sudden you start realizing what's required for those kinds of things. And, and that kind of processing with that many graphics cards enabled gives a whole new level to processing power. Right. No, that's that's absolutely true. <clears throat> I, mean, I always think, you know, video and audio, but of course there's many other areas that this is going to be beneficial for medical. Well, I mean, you got to remember that Macs are, are widely used in, in business development for, for ma in mathematical problem solving. I mean, you know, the applications used for modeling and things like that are all based on Mac. And you, you think of science and industry, everybody thinks of PCs, but so many of the, the, the research projects in medicine and all that are all based in Macs. And, right. and it's a different level of processing that has to be done, particularly on the mathematics side. Some of the stuff that's being done in mathematics on Macs is pretty amazing. Absolutely. So what about these... So I guess the, this SSD in the Mac Pro is the NVE cards. Is that what they are? Flash memory? M M M M -E, yeah. Yeah. So I guess that's what they're using now. So I guess anybody will be able to put a SSD that will fit in there and replace it. Because I'm not planning on buying it. I'll get to like maybe 512 if it can be replaced by a third party. I, you know, it, it should be the way that the modular, I'm, I'm pretty assuming that, you know, those things fail. And, and in a modular system, you have to swap that kind of thing out because drives fail. Right. Um, so I, I expect that. Um, but it's like anything else. You know, they want to make money in the first pass. So you get it and usually go with, the, you know, I'm kind of one of those guys that I need a minimum of a terabyte in my laptop. Um, I, I, I need to have a lot of storage. Sure. But believe it or not, I keep that much in there, but I never put more than half of it full. 
Right. I keep it empty. I keep it empty for caching and other things when I'm on the road or working on location and that. So I always leave a lot of space open. So I have a drive much bigger than what I actually have content on for just the ability to use the drive when I need it. No, exactly. And, like, and, and think about it. How fast is the how fast is your laptop now? I mean, my rap, my laptop reads and writes at about a gigabyte and a half a second. Yeah. You know, it's it's ridiculously fast. Yeah, mine and, is and too. That, yeah. So that's the advantage of those kind of cards. And you put them on a port or you put them on something else. And, you know, you start maintaining a gigabyte a second across your workflows. And all of a sudden, video editing is not complicated anymore. No, you know, it's, moving, it's... moving data is not the pain in the ass that it was 10 years ago. We were no, absolutely. Push, absolutely. Push everything to a Firewire port. <laughs> yeah, Firewire and Firewire 800 for a while. I still have a any few kind, of those interfaces any, around. Any kind, any kind of firewire port. Oh, I have a couple of them. I, I, I laughingly keep them around for as a joke. Right. Um, I have, I have a Thunderbolt two to firewire eight hundred cable that sits on my desk. I have not used it since I went to Thunderbolt three. Well, I, I agree. Yeah. I have one for, uh, I have a firewire eight hundred uh, DVD burner that I have hooked up. If I have to oh, burn wow. a DVD, so I, you know, I have hooked up. I have hooked up into a uh, one of these docks because actually the, just, uh, the one of them has FireWire 800, the old, one of the older ones. So I, I, I just I just like them because it's like you know, hey, all those I have all those on USB now. USB got has finally caught up to what we want, what the Windows guys always thought it was, and what we always wanted from it. So well, they said USB nice four is going to be equal to, or or else an update to USB three is going to be equal to Thunderbolt three. Uh, USB four has exactly the same specs as Thunderbolt three. Yeah, the, but but Thunderbolt three is not standing still though. No, no. So by the but, time but, USB four that, comes out. Well, yeah, but the confusion is just ridiculous, and and I actually had a long chat with some people at Intel about that. It's like you know. You announce something and then you don't even put specs out for for six or eight months because the specs aren't due until September. Ah. The USB four specs are not due until September, and it's like, but you're doing Thunderbolt three. Why don't you just say it's going to be Thunderbolt three and we'll, sure. you know, we'll we'll start a naming convention. And there's lots of other things like that that get involved. In. Um, the biggest thing with the USB spec is power, because of how much power it wants. Okay. And, and and you run into issues, particularly in long run cables, um, about compatibility. Now, one of the interesting things I saw on the Apple website is uh, Apple Pro USB three cables. Did you see those? Yeah, I saw them mentioned. Yes. So, what the <laughs> heck is that? Are they are they uh, optical or something, or what the heck are they? Um, um, I, I I I don't know for sure, but I'm betting I'm kind of bet they are. Yeah. That's what I would think. I'm, I have an optical Thunderbolt 3 cable um, from, from my friends at Corning. Um, I got it at NAB as a prototype, and it's pretty amazing. I have a five-meter cable. Um, it's thinner and lighter than the old one. It's not quite as durable, um, but then I'm not taking it out in combat, so it's, it's right. more than durable for, for mainstream work that I do. But a five-meter cable allows me to put my drives in another room you know, and run it through and be able to have right. quiet and silence in my, in my suite. We're right. doing recording, which right. has been really important. Um, you know, we were able to do that in Thunderbolt 2, Thunderbolt, Thunderbolt 2. But with Thunderbolt 3, you've been kind of held back by the limitations. But the first of the optical cables have now started shipping um, or just getting ready to start shipping. I think they start shipping July 1. Um, and I think that's that's what you're going to see. But, yeah, I'm kind of assuming that the 5-meter uh, pro cable from Apple is made by Corning or somebody like that because it's just it would be a logical assumption have a, a professional cable like that that does power so. so it also has a new keyboard did you notice i you know i, I saw that but it's like okay you know, there, another apple keyboard that I well it's it's, it's black it's black keys with the silver uh yeah. base it's not, i'm that's not a, sure that's going to be a bitch to see at night you yeah know, that's in true a grading suite in a yeah. grading suite a black keyboard really well the Even keys are black lit? the keys well, are the black keys are, yeah but it's but yeah, it's black. But now you got to turn the backlighting on. Oh, the backlighting. Do, do, can I change the color in the backlighting because it doesn't match what I need to have for color balancing on my display? But that's you know, an upgrade kind of, from it's an upgrade from the 2013 Mac Pro because we didn't get a keyboard. Well, that'd be true. So man, the trash can the trash can was all its own, man. No, it was <laughs> like if somebody uh, T. Payton said that on the last one of these we did. It's like the cube. 
Remember the cube? Oh man, I love my cubes. Uh, but that's what I'm I saying. Guess, but it was it was it, it was nice. Yeah. It was designed well, but it had limitations. Yeah, it was hot. It was noisy. <laughs> it was hot. Yeah. Part ports, you know, the plugs would always fall out of it. It was hot. <laughs> so, f from what I understand, the Mac Pro has speakers, <laughs> but the display does not. Uh, yeah, I didn't see any specs for speakers in the display. That doesn't surprise me, though. Yeah. And I don't know, man. I, I, the, the display, the display is Apple's. Apple does some great things. XDR is bullshit. I'm sorry. <laughs> It is. You can't. You can't. You can't make a specification and make it something that nobody exists. And and it's not HDR. It's not P3. It's not a couple of things. They didn't build it to a standard. Okay. It's got a thousand nits, but a peak brightness at sixteen hundred. Right. But that doesn't match HDR specs. So it's Wait. XDR, but 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 HDR, but. Under Dolby, it's still not bright enough. So it's like it, it's kind of a hit and miss in my world. I thought the the programmable zones were too small, too big. Okay, uh, they're like an inch square, and they should be much smaller than that. Um, blue LEDs to control light. I'm um, wow. Being somebody who's played a lot with LED technology and and done seminars on the science behind LEDs, that terrifies me. I want to see a spectrum analyzer on that. I want to take a photo spectrometer and shoot the damn thing and say, okay, so give me a color of light and see what it does. Because no LED, or for the most part, LEDs always have some discrepancy in the color range. Okay. There's parts of color they never see. Hmm. Blue LEDs in particular don't progress to do white displays. You know, a blue LED is not going to give you tungsten. Tungsten does not give you daylight. You know, it's to get that much conversion, you have to manipulate the hell out of it to get that kind of level of, of stuff. And it's it's interesting. And what do you do and how do you get it? Hmm. You know, why not, why not go with a white display, a white LED, which is a known technology that you can make either color? Why start with a color that you have to buy it so far to go the other way? No idea. And, and, and no color person that I know, nobody, no colorist that I know who works, makes their living in colorist is considered this a professional display. So what, it's, at that price point, what kind of a display would you recommend then? At that price point, I could go out and buy an LG 8 series okay. and get 100% of Dolby spec, 1,000 nits of brightness uh, at 65 inches and put it on my wall. Okay. You know, for 5,000 bucks. Well, they, they not even, not even have to buy the stand then. That's 5,000 bucks buys the display. Oh, wait, that, 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 now that's a pro stand. It's called the pro stand. <laughs> well, there's going to be on some... top of the Mac with wheels and roll it around. You have a really nice rolling suitcase. So I'm not going to get I'm not going to get wheels for it. But since I'm a carpenter, I will build a little wheeled cart if I want to. I'll just put it in. It'll be custom formed. Yeah. And I'll roll it well, around I mean, myself. And, and, and let's be honest. <laughs> You know, I don't have a stand on any. I have one monitor on my desk that has a stand. Okay. All the rest of all the rest of them are on Vesa mounts. There you all go. All the monitors on my and even even when I'm working on location, other than my laptop screen, all my monitors are at Vesa mounts. On. Okay. So that's not really an issue for me. Right. Um, I, my, I work on articulated arms. That's not that's not a big deal. A thousand bucks for an articulated arm is pretty high. Sorry, it just is. But that's um, not an. Oh, that you mean the stand? Yeah, the stand. The stand. Yeah. Yeah. A thousand so, bucks for the stand. Yeah. So it has Bluetooth 5.0, and here's something interesting I just found out. You can use Find My Mac without Wi-Fi. You can use it with your iPhone because it has some kind of a beacon technology. So if for some reason it got stolen, you don't have to depend on Wi-Fi to locate it. Well, yeah, that's actually been it. That's actually been in a bunch of the devices for a while. Oh, it has um, been okay. It's 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 actually in the iPhone 10, the XR, um, the new iPad Pros added that to Find My Mac, and it works over Bluetooth. It works like a tile does. So it uses Bluetooth, and because there's okay. so many Bluetooth devices, that's interesting. Interesting, you bring that up because one of the things I've been working on lately is um, uh, I'm working on getting people to understand wireless and what goes on in wireless. Because when we work in, a, in, in wireless on set, we don't think about the, the literally thousands of devices that generate 
EM, electromagnetic interference. And, and, and when you work in a, a place, I mean, I, I have a 3,000 square foot office. Um, I have roughly 1,100 devices that emit EM in my office. 1,100? Yeah, 1,107. Wow. And, and, it's things, and it's things you don't think about. It's your phone. It's your laptop. It's your keyboard. It's, it's you know, my AirPods. It's my, car, my key fob. It's, it's the alarms. It's every television that I have in my place that's not a, a you know, that doesn't have SDI on it. Every one of my televisions emits EM. Um, the remotes all emit EM. Um, you know, my car fob, I had an issue in the wintertime because my car, I don't park my car. I park my car outside. I'm not in the garage. But if my car was lying aside from my window in the wintertime, it would actually drain my battery because it would ping my car so much. It drained the battery in my 2017 automobile wow. because it would constantly be reaching out to it in the wintertime and it would drain the battery. Huh. And it happened twice over the winter. Finally parked my car another like 20, 30, 40 feet away and it didn't happen anymore. Now, how'd you figure that was, was happening? Because I went out three times in three weeks and had my car dead. But I mean, I would just think I need a new I battery. Well, it was a brand new automobile. The car's got 15,000 oh. miles on it. Okay. Should not need a new battery. Okay. I mean, I literally just got it to 15,000 miles last weekend. So it's literally a brand new automobile. Okay. Because I would never but, think yeah. my my key fob was doing that. I wouldn't know. That. Yeah, but I, I but I have I have wireless sensing stuff in my office, so it would keep telling me what's what's this pinging out, and it was constantly calling my car my car. And I was like, you don't think of those kinds of things. And no, it's like, no. Every single thing, you know. And there's, you know, I've got three Apple TVs and the remotes. I've got, you know, three cable boxes and and three wireless routers, and you know, and then the wireless master router from the cable company. And then you don't think of everything that's in the house, you know, the, the smart sensor on the fish tank, the, you know, everything. Yeah. That well, you I never, yeah. Place that, that there, there's so many things that you don't think about where there's some kind of, of EM and, and, and wireless is complicated. Right. And, and it's, you know, and, and people forget, you know, I, I, I take it down to something just as basic. We used to have problems with uh, Wi-Fi because of microwaves, you know, because the microwave oven was sure. There. And I like to remind people, how many times have you ever looked down in the microwave and looked at the popcorn when it was popping or watched something cooking and all of that? Every time you do that, think of those little holes that you're looking through <laughs> right. and realize that there are five microns large, smaller than the wave the microwave is producing. So those little tiny holes that you look at through, through the microwave, through the door in a microwave, are five microns smaller than the actual height of the wave Just that barely. is emitted to cook the food. Yeah, just barely. No, I always walk away from my microwave. I don't. Uh, I don't stay by it. I figure it's destroying people, brain cells. Some people do. I mean, you have. We all have. Right. And that's what's funny about it is, is that you don't think about that. You, you know, you don't think about where that is. And that EM is part of this whole new world that we have to deal with. And and it's so difficult for people coming up to understand that that kind of stuff affects set. And you, and if you're on set. And you got, you know, Bluetooth 5 coming in from your monitor. Now, all of a sudden, oh, that bleeds into the spectrum that the audio guys are using. Okay. Or it bleeds into the spectrum that my my wireless follow focus uses or my wireless video signal uses. You know, you start thinking about that and you start adding multiple things into the level. And it's like, I took a wireless scanner on a set a couple of weeks ago and found roughly 6,000 devices on a stage that were generating EM. 6,000. 6,000, just under it. Yeah, it's like 5,800 and something. But 6,000 devices on a stage, you know, it, it was probably 70,000 square feet, probably had 200 people working on it. Yeah. But think of all of that, that clutter sure. in the wireless spectrum and how that affects everything around us. Now, can you, <clears throat> can you detect UFOs with that device? Uh, not yet. <laughs> Have you seen anything you can't identify? <laughs> uh, I've seen a lot of things I can't identify. Huh. Still hunt for them. I've got I've got a, a, a an anomalous signal in my office that we can't seem to find, hmm. and it's the kind of thing you get with with um, encrypted video signals. Hmm. So it's like somebody put and I and I've tracked it to a location. I know kind of think I know what it is. It's a security camera that somebody put inside their unit, right? Because um, it because it's not in the hallway. I can I can see it and I can see the signal it's getting out and I can ping the device. So it's something that's looking for that. But I mean, people put wireless video cameras up, and if you you know you put in. ADT or Simply Safe or Comcast sure, Security, sure. you've got a bunch of wireless video cameras that can be hacked. And, it, and it's all of these things that are wireless that people don't think about. 
So are you, are your concern is the security or is your concern health or both? Both. Well, if you don't know they're there, they can be hacked because you haven't changed them. Um, and health is another issue. I, I, I have a couple of friends who worked extensively in the cellular field in the early days. And one of them, she was a, she was a lead engineer at Motorola for many years, um, ended up with mouth cancer. Wow. From working on prototype phones. I mean, early, early overpowered phones. Sure, sure. And, it, and it's an issue. And you have to think about how those kinds of things affect people because, you know, we haven't subjected the body to those before. Right, right. But it's like anything else. We get back to that. It's, it's uh, you know, do we make sure that the, the air is healthy and the water is healthy and everything else? You know, it's like it's just like everything else. You have to control everything around you to make sure it's safe. You're right. So what's the and first not, thing you're going to run when you get your Mac Pro? What's the first app? System update. <laughs> first, first thing I always run when I get a computer is update that. I update everything in it. It's yeah. the very first thing I ever do. So run I'll, the updates. I'll, I'll, I'll be getting my new 2019 Mac, MacBook Pro this week. And the first thing I do is I do a few updates and make sure I have the apps. Then I do a carbon copy cloner of that drive. So I have a pristine copy before I start loading oh, yeah. stuff before I start loading stuff on well I mean so you remember I have a huge massive storage array in my office yeah you do and and, and uh, a cable a, a Thunderbolt 2 cable optical cable that runs down to my archive and anything I plug in on that cable automatically gets cloned on my network okay it's designed that way it was designed and such it is and it's it attaches to the head of a Mac mini um, so all I do is plug it in, and then like 12 minutes later, my my Mac top, my lap, Mac laptop is all backed up. Okay, it, it's quite convenient. So I I do cloning a lot because I think I think it's the best way to archive a system. I mean, I use while I do do Time Machine, I find that having a full clone of my system is much more convenient, and I have enough storage to have 10 years of them. You know, a, a quarterly clone of my machine uh, for the last 10 years. Which is not as much as people think it is. I mean, which of, in the early days they were five hundred, they were two hundred fifty-six gig drives, and right. you know, lately they have exactly. five hundred twelve gig drives. It's like, yeah, okay, a thousand terabyte drive with half the stuff on. It's like, yeah, my ten-year archive is less than 10, 15 terabytes. Wow, ten years. Yeah. Now, how often do you access drive, drives? Are, I I don't access it at all. Right. I keep <laughs> I, I, I keep I keep a running archive um, on Time Machine. I do quarterly backups that are clones of the system and just put them on the drive to keep it. But it's right. not not even 15 terabytes. Do you have any uh, off-site backup? I do. Um, uh, a lot, actually. More okay. More than most. Okay. Um, well, it's because I, I'm part of a shared network. And, and part of what we did when we set up these two or three locations that, that share stuff is we also clone each other's stuff on their systems. So okay. I, I, I have... I have a petabyte of um, shared storage in the cloud. So, wow. That's yeah. incredible. Yeah, it's work. It's business. No, I know. That's, I know. that's, that's why, that's why 20,000 for an, a, a new Mac didn't like blink at me. You right. Know, it's right. It's, it's it, if you're doing this for a living, the costs are the costs. Right. You know, it's like, buying it's like buying a car or going to the doctor or anything else. You, well, they, you, you know, know, it's like they, they wanted a pro machine. And then when they got this one, they said, that's too pro. It's yeah. too much. Okay, well, then stick with the iMac Pro or a couple of Mac Minis or whatever you want. Or, with... or don't buy the top of the line. Well, that's true, too. That's well, true. And, and you look at it, too. If you need one PCI slot, this is all. You can still do that over Thunderbolt. Yes. If you, if, if, if you need one or two PCI slots, you can do that over Thunderbolt and get most of the bandwidth you need. You can plug an eGPU on a MacBook Pro or an iMac and get accelerated processing to get what you need if you're a mid-level user. If you are make your living on the machine, that's a different story. Yes. I mean, you don't, you, don't, you don't buy a truck, you don't buy a car to do truck deliveries. It's that simple. Right. And trucks, trucks cost more than cars do. They, they do. The last, they're made to last, run longer, run harder, get beat up more, take more abuse, and last. And right. be repairable and fixable. And well, that's what Apple did here. Well, the fact that the Mac Pro can be upgraded, I, you know, I presume with, up, you know, PCI cards, with graphics cards, with whatever I want, 
this will last me a lot longer than my normal two and a half to three year cycle. It'll be with right. me. I'll, I'll just keep it forever and just you know upgrade it as necessary. Well, look how many people are are still upgrading their old you know cheese graters, old generation cheese graters. Right, exactly. The, 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 you know the trash can didn't allow allow that, but the cheese graters were definitely upgradable. So besides the amount of PCIe slots, were you surprised it was a cheese grater again? <laughs> Yeah, it's like I said, oh, cheese grater extreme. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, it, it makes for a good joke because it shows how well the design was thought out. First. Exactly. I was ecstatic. I, I just, I couldn't believe it when I saw that. I was watching yeah. live. I, I, I was just more surprising surprised at the fact that you have to use a screwdriver to put it together. Yeah, that's an that interesting just, point. I had no, you know, no idea. Well, it was just it was just by based on what I saw on the sheet because I haven't seen it up close. I haven't seen one in person. Okay. So I, I, I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't at WD, WDC, so I didn't get to see one. So. And, what's and I don't know? think they, well, I don't think they've been shown anywhere else. I don't think you like you can go in the store and see one yet. No, I don't think you can. There's a couple of um, people that have them apparently. One or one or two people on YouTube, I think, Apple got them copies. And you said that uh, Pro Tools has one. Abbott has one. Yeah, yeah, Abbott has one. Yeah, I'm. Sh I knew there were. I, I mean, there were a couple of dozen. I mean, I I knew a couple of people that had. Them. Okay. Oh, so it was. Yeah, I mean, that had the test units and got to see them. So I okay. knew what was going on. So how well, how's your relationship with Apple these days? Because I know it's. It ebbs and tides. You know, I ran into one of the people from the current pro app team at Cinegear. Or, okay. Yeah, Cine Gear. Uh, ran into to Colleen there, and she said hi and everything. I don't really know anybody on the pro apps teams anymore, or anybody. Okay. There. I mean, everybody I know is gone. Right. And 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 while I mean, I know Frank Casanova and and, and a whole bunch of the higher up guys. Um, I ran into Tim Dashwood, who's who's. I'll got it everywhere I turned around. I ran into Tim Dashwood when I was right. when I was in LA. Um, he and I are old friends um, from the Dashwood plug-in days. But it's oh, one okay. of those things that that um, you know. Hey, it's nice to see old friends and all of that. But I don't see that many people that I know that still work for Apple. I can count most of them on one hand. Okay, and, and they're all in management, and they're all in management positions. So I can't ever talk to them about anything. And Steve Bays left recently, like six months ago. Uh, last that was last fall. year, yeah. That was last yeah, year. last fall. Yeah. So those are the ones that I know. I, I see the team all the time at either at NAB or at the uh, Final Cut Pro Creative Summit, which is coming up uh, later in the fall, probably November, yeah. some sometime in November like it was last That'll year. That'll be interesting to see, see when they actually, because they'll have machine shipping by then. Yes. So it'll be interesting to see that. Yeah, because we always go to Apple HQ and they do a demo, and then they have a separate room set up. You can hands on and everything. So I'm going to presume I, I'm going to presume Final Cut Pro 10.5 is going to be out by then or out that weekend, and then we'll have it on the Mac Pro. That'll be fantastic. Yeah, I would agree with that too. Yeah, that'd be the logical thing to do. Logical, yeah, because you have to have, you know, they've set it up so the Final Cut Pro Creative Summit is also. At the same time, Apple debuts a new version of Final Cut. For the last three or four yeah. years, they've done that. At least a preview of it. They've done right. they've done, done the preview or an actual release. So, and then two, well, three, and three years ago, they had the 2016 Mac Pro, MacBook Pro come out the day before, or the morning of, or something. Thursday was Thursday. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I, I never think about it that way because I don't follow one or the other anymore. I follow the hardware more than I follow the software. Right. Right. Well, I usually I, mean, I used to fly into SFO and then take a, a shuttle down to Cupertino because they didn't have any direct flights to San Jose. Now, right. now Southwest has a direct flight, so I can go to San Jose, which is ten minutes away or ten miles away versus thirty miles away, whatever it is. Yeah, that's the great thing about Chicago. We've already had direct flights to to, uh, to San Jose just because of it was American. I fly on American out of here. Okay. So. Yeah, I didn't have any direct from BWI, but I do this yeah, year. Yeah, that's checked. the difference between being in Baltimore or not. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The last time I was in Chicago, I took a flight. I, I, I taught for Future Media Concepts, a Final Cut Pro course, and it was winter time, and they had to de-ice the plane. And I'm like, wow, 30-minute yeah. yeah. delay. I'm watching the guy out there spraying the antifreeze, whatever the heck he's doing on the wings. Yeah. Probably glycol, yep. Well, yeah, I'm like, yeah. okay, well, I guess you guys know what you're doing. Hey, they do it all the time. 
what's really fun is you go into cold places where they actually heat the fuel before they put it in a plane. Mm. That's really funny. When you see the vans with the fuel come up and their feet rising from them, they mm. keep the fuel warm to load them. That's no, in I... really cold places. That's not in Chicago. Well, Chicago is damn cold. I mean, we get, uh, we get cold like here. 70... It's 75 and sunny here. I lived in D.C. I know that. I grew up well, in that yeah, stuff. I got it. Yeah. It's like, yeah. So it's like, you know, you it, it's like D.C. has some of the craziest weather. And people who don't understand how crazy the weather is in Washington, D.C., it was a hazardous duty post for foreign um, dignitaries until the early 1980s. Is that right? Yeah. And, and and it was a it was a hazardous duty post for the American military and naval officers until like the 60s. And it was more because of the heat in Washington, D.C. and the mosquitoes than anything else. Oh, OK. But but no, D.C. used to be a hazardous duty post for foreign dignitaries because of the normal heat in Washington, D.C. in the summertime. OK. So do, are you editing with Final Cut at all these days? Are you using... uh, I cut. I, I do spot stuff in Final Cut, but for the most part, um, I'm not. OK. What are you using? Resolve, Premiere? I'm, I, I'm Resolve. Well, it depends on what I need. Okay. Um, I had to do a project recently where I was doing a lot of uh, still animation of, of still photos. Yep. And and the integration between Premiere and After Effects is so good in that Tight, aspect right. that I actually did it for that rewall well, because I just start something in Premiere and go in and finish it in After Effects and then send it back. Sure. And it, like, okay, that's just that's just a home run in my thing. Um, I'm still learning Fusion, so doing those kinds of moves in in Resolve is a little pain in the butt. Right, <laughs> but that's only because I don't know fusion enough right. to well, yeah. Um, and I'm still trying to get my wrapping my stuff around Fairlight, but right. But I still think I still think, you know, it, it, it's what your choice is. It's what you work in. Sure. I'm tr sure. I tended to do you know fairly small projects that require that I'm everything on producer, editor, all that kind of stuff. So it's a little bit different than guys who are who are working in mixed environments. Um, I I don't have anything against Final Cut. I just after Final Cut 10 and what went on in the beginning right. with Apple guys screaming at me and everybody hating the fact that I'm going, well, but there's no professional I.O. in this. What am I supposed to do? Sure. I'm a professional. I've got to put this out on something and I can't do that. Right. And and that's kind of tainted my opinion on Apple for a very long time. That doesn't mean that Final Cut's chain has gotten, you know, is not a professional product. It just means that I got away from it because I... I had to at a period of time. Sure. I, I, understand. I still use it for a lot of things. I, and I tell you what, I make dailies in Final Cut until they started changing the OS because I'm on a new version of the OS. So they started changing the OS and took out all the 32-bit stuff. Doing dailies in Final Cut and Compressor still beat everything else hands down. Yeah, I and keep Compressor, seeing that. Compressor to me, hands down, is faster than everything else when it comes to making H.264 and H.265 files. Right. So, you know, doing the HVEC stuff, HEVC compression in 10 bit and final in compressor is far superior to it as in any other app. It's better than Resolve. It's better than, than uh, Adobe's media encoding. Well, here's, here's so I keep, one. I keep compressor around for that purpose. Sorry so they, the, the Sharp has an 8K <laughs> camera out for less than $5,000, right? Yeah, I saw that. Here's the funny thing. If you get an 8K camera, your proxies are going to be 4K. Proxies are going to be 4K. That's not really a proxy, but that's what Final yeah, Cut is. does at this point. I mean, that's, you know, 4K is what I've used, been using for years, so that's going to be interesting. Well, and think about it, too. Is, I mean, you know, you know, you look at it. Um, I've been shooting a lot with a, a, a Fuji X-T3. Um, it's not a full-frame sensor. It's sensor is Super 35. Okay. Um, and, it re and it records in 10-bit HEVC. Now, the hilarious part about this codec, beautiful, works great, I love it, cannot play back in real time on any of my Macs. Is that right? <laughs> Plays back in real time on all my Windows machines, will not play back on any of my Macs. I must transcode it to do it. I can drop it into Premiere and see it, and it'll play back fine in Premiere, it'll play back fine in Final Cut, plays back fine in Resolve, will not play on the desktop by itself. What, uh, what desktop are you using? <clears throat> uh, I'm on uh, the latest version of Mojave. No, I mean the desktop oh. itself, the the Mac. Oh, uh, on my laptop. So. Oh, okay, yeah, because it play I, it, it, I, it. I can play back ten bit H H E V C on my twenty seventeen iMac, which is the reason I got it. I got it so well, I could. But I've been, yeah, but I've got a twenty seventeen, 
you know, laptop with 32 gigs of RAM and, and, and solid state. It should be able to play it back. No, I, I agree. I agree. But is that, the, is, is that a limitation of the OS? You know, I, th I think it's something that Apple's put in the hardware. Okay. Because okay. I can put on an eGPU and it runs fine. Oh, like, oh, okay. But but, okay. but how come how come I can I can play this on my Windows machine? I can I play fine on my iPad. I can drop the files on my oh, iPad. Oh yeah, play you're room. right because LumaFusion like, can it, play. But it. it will not play on my laptop. For, yeah, is, for, for I forgot reason. about that. So, so yeah. LumaFusion, you know, that's the iPad NLE, right? And it just came out with version 2.0, and I really like it. It's really fantastic. I've had it for a while. It's really amazing. Yeah. So here's the interesting thing is. They're putting out a Mac version of it coming in the fall. They 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 told me about it back at NAB, and and then they've since subsequently have announced that they, yeah they are working on a Mac version of it. Yeah, so it's pretty, it's pretty outstanding. It it really is. It really is. It has a lot of great great features that even NLEs don't have. I mean, well, and 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 that and if you work on a, a mobile device, God, go out and buy Filmic Pro. Yes, both Filmic of those. Pro, Filmic Pro, yep. particularly on my Android phone, which I used as a camera, is so far superior to anything on Android. And and I wish I could get the focus controls on my iPhone. That's the great thing about it is I can actually do the focus controls on it. Because right. that's one of those things that really excels about me is the ability to, to change the focusing and do the focusing differently. Sure, Cause sure. Because Apple's focus system is crap. Well, it's meant for the being general able, public, right? Yeah, being able to, to record that way is actually pretty cool. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I got a beep in my ear for something. So okay. Help. Somebody's pinging me on Skype. <laughs> All right. Anything else we want to talk about? No, this has been fun, Richard. Absolutely. Always glad to be on here. Absolutely. So. If you make sure you let me know if you're coming back to the East Coast for anything, we'll hook up for lunch. I will. I will. Yeah. Baltimore, I, I, Washington. I don't, I don't know what's happening. So probably going to be at uh, um, NAB New York for a day or two. Okay. To fly out. I'm trying to coordinate some stuff with that. Um, what about yeah, GV Expo in the in the I, fall in the winter? That's actually a good question. That's a, that's a show I really like going to. I always did. I actually liked it when it had the security show in combination with it. Where right. you go down to the basement and see all the security stuff. That right. was a whole lot more fun. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I'll probably be out for that. So maybe we can do a live one together. Yeah, that's that's in December. I think the first week of December always, or something. The first week in December. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. It com it conflicts with a show that I always do in L.A., um, so I have to kind of coordinate where they're at and how I sure. do it. So absolutely. Um, yeah, it's uh, time to get on a plane again. So it's yeah. Like, it, right after NAB, I don't usually fly until Cine Gear, which is really nice. But after Cine Gear, about the Fourth of July, I hit the ground running and start traveling. I've got nine trips scheduled to the East Coast: uh, North Carolina, Atlanta, right, Miami. Um, Looking forward. Been asked to go speak in Munich this fall, so I'm thinking really? like, that'll be fun. Yeah, so that could be kind of fun. So, where can people find you on Twitter? Oh, I am at Twitter and Instagram. It's all the same at Gary Adcock. First name, Very... last name together. I keep it nice and simple. So. Exactly. Um, I don't spend a lot of time on Facebook, so if you ping me there, I might not see it. So I'm on, yeah. but I'm on Instagram and Twitter every day. Oh, the okay. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I haven't I haven't done much on Instagram yet, but I I do have an account, and I, and I of course Richard Taylor's taken up everywhere, so I just added TV to the end. Yeah. So everywhere so, Richard well, Taylor. Well, the thing TV. Is, is that, well, it's like I, the Facebook thing is I took it off my phone. I was having problems with it, so I took Facebook off my phone. I left Messenger on. Didn't realize what kind of problems that would cause. Um, but I I keep Facebook on my iPad and it's on my computer. But I don't have Facebook on my phone because I just I was stunned at the amount of data they were trying to mine from me. Absolutely. So, Everybody talks you know, about and that. Like, and, and I had turned all of that off so they couldn't even get to it. But it was still one of those things that was like I was still stunned at how much data they were trying to get. No, absolutely. And every, I, yeah. and every time you turn it on, it's like I don't have the phone or I don't have Instagram and Twitter don't have access to my cat, my camera or my microphone. Because I don't do anything direct at them. Sure. It's like I get so frustrated because they always keep taking me to. Do you want to load your camera up? And you, you know, like leave me alone. Right. God, they're as bad as a, they're as bad as Adobe. Adobe with the the constant flash updates. <laughs> oh yeah, and then they had the fake ones that were actually some kind of a virus and stuff. They were oh, Im yeah, imitating I, I, imitating the flash updates. Well, but I don't ever trust anybody's things anyway. So I always go to my operating system. Absolutely. Like if I get that shit on a website, it's usually fake anyways. 
Right. And 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 it's one of those things with God. Now I'm going to think where every time I update the OS or update a part of the OS, Flash wants to to reinsert itself into my life, and it's like, go away. <laughs> well, what do you even use it? You know, I don't I don't use Flash for anything that I know of. I don't have it on my computer. Uh, Adobe Connect, a lot of the Adobe apps. Are oh. So if you okay. use any of the Adobe extensions or any of the Adobe uh, um, uh, mobile apps, they all want Flash. Okay. And that's that's just stupid. Why does Adobe want Flash on my iPad? In 2019, yeah. Yeah. Well, and most most of the issue I'm having is on my laptop because it's keep coming on my laptop. But it's like Silverlight wants it, and if you're doing any kind of, you know, Zoom or anything else, you've got to install all the Zoom wants it. And it's, you know, whoever somebody wants to use anything for, there's always these apps that want to load stuff like that in. All right. I think we're done. <laughs> cool, man. <laughs> I've had three or four people ping me and say what a nice interview it is. So yeah. it's like they keep popping up, and I'm like, oh, well, you're watching this. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah the, the, these uh, Final Cut Pro Radio TV Live, they, they get between 600 to 1,000 views over the next couple of weeks because, huh. because, because it's, huh. a cross, it's cross-platform. You know, yeah. Facebook has well, a, lot of, a lot of you. Well, and, and that's the thing is, is that, that we're out there sharing information that people want to know about, and they think about it just— you know, it wasn't just Final Cut we talked about. It's all kinds of things. No, and exactly. You know, it was about the hardware, and it's about educating people. And it's a difficult time because there's so much information out there. But where do you go for something you trust? Where do yes. you go for the information that's that's valid and honest and truthful for what your needs are? Right. We have those issues all the time, and it's a problem. It absolutely is. I, I know there's some places that I trust more than others as far as that stuff goes. And, and I always look on... Why they're making a review, you know, sometimes it's anti, sometimes it's pro, but why, what's the incentive for them to do a review? See who, if they're being funded by some something else. Well, or, or you get these guys who do reviews based on never seeing the product. Well, that's the other thing. And, 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 and I'm up to my armpits and reviews I'm trying to finish right now. And it's one of those things that's like, no, if I haven't touched it, I'm not going to talk about it. That's good. I can give you an it's not you. You, I can tell you what it is, but it, you don't get an opinion because I don't can't have one on something I haven't seen. Yeah. You know, it's and that's why I'm honest about talking about the Mac Pro. I find these things interesting, but I haven't touched one yet. Right. So until right. we actually get our hands on one, where it's all hyperbole. Yeah. No, absolutely. But I. But like I said, I intend. I usually sell my Macs. I intend to keep this Mac Pro. I don't and ever intend to sell it, and maybe at least not for like six, seven years. So mm -hmm. I still have my other ones, my original cheese graters. Hey, they make great park benches. There, well, I, I, out of it. I, there's a couple of people that made park benches out of them. I saw all, <laughs> all kinds of things people have been doing with it, but now that's the new one's in. And it's so funny. I mean, you know, people saying, oh, it looks like a cheese grater. No kidding. You think Apple didn't notice that? You think Apple didn't do that intentionally? It's right. like, whatever, whatever. Yeah. I'm looking forward. All right, I, all right. I'm looking forward to getting one probably 2020. I'll wait till next year after the benchmarks and stuff like that are out and yeah, the first one's coming out will be rough, and, and, and there'll always be issues with it. There'll be some kind of thing. There'll be some announcement. Watch it the minute they start shipping, they'll start announcing NVIDIA support. Well, I, 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 don't ex I do expect them to do support Inua CUDA, I think is what it is. Well, I'm, I, just think, I just think they're going to battle over it until somebody finds a way to fix it. You know, that's the thing. I yep. think somebody will find a way to hack it. Yep. There's a lot of really smart people out there. Oh, absolutely. Now you have access to it. But I, I'm, I am looking to find forward to Final Cut Pro 10.5, which, which is unusual. Apple, on their website for Final Cut Pro, says a new version is coming out this fall. They showed the new version of Logic Pro at uh -huh. WWDC. And then, of course, the Mac Pro itself and then the displays are coming, you know, September or October or whatever. So they've done all this pre-announcing. Apple doesn't do that. Apple doesn't pre-announce products. Now they have. They pre -announced, I mean, they, they told us about the Mac Pro two years ago. Well, yeah, yeah exactly. But they knew, they said it was a 2019 product. And here it is, 2019. Yeah. And not even, yeah. at, not even <laughs> December. Yeah, Ship, ships December 1st. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. All right, Gary, thanks a lot for coming on. I will be talking to you again, man. All right, Richard. Howie's good. Have a good one, man. Talk to you Peace later. Up.